Welcome back to Historical Context. Today we continue our Growth and Fracturing of New England series. Today's episode continues with the Massachusetts Bay Colony, and we last left off at the end of of 1631 as the colony was expanding into various towns and dealing with a variety of challenges. January of 1632 was rather uneventful as the group traveled inland and they named two streams, the Beaver Brook and the Masters Brook. Those of you in the Boston area may recognize the Beaver Brook as that name has held to this day. Interesting that they would choose the month of January to travel and name those uh, bodies of water. And they didn't stop there. In early February, they did more traveling and naming. On February 17th, Winthrop had to deal with a municipal issue that popped up in Watertown. Let's have a look. The occasion was for that a warrant being sent to Watertown for levying of eight pounds, part of a rate of 60 pounds, ordered for fortifying of the new town. The pastor and elder assembled the people and delivered their opinions that it was not sale to pay monies after that sort for fear of bringing themselves and posterity into bondage. Being come before the governor and council after much debate, they acknowledged their fault, confessing freely that they were in an error and made a retraction. He goes on to say, the ground of their error was for that they took this government to be no other but as of a mayor and alderman who have not power to make laws or raise taxes without the people. But understanding that this government was rather in the nature of a parliament and that no assistant could be chosen but by the freemen who had power likewise to remove the assistance. So basically I'm calling the Watertown issue the first tax fight in Massachusetts and there are going to be plenty to come but it was the first time that a town said well we're not going to pay to have fortification and apparently they thought that they were sovereign from the other communities but they're actually a part of the Massachusetts Bay Colony so they had to uh, obey that order. So the, the governmental misunderstanding gets cleared up, but then on April 3rd, which is about six weeks later, more trouble within the government. Let's have a look. At a court at Boston, the deputy, Mr. Dudley, went away before the court was ended, and then the secretary delivered the governor a letter from him, directing to the governor and his assistants wherein he declared a resignation of his deputyship and place of assistant, but it was not allowed. So essentially the gentleman here that they're referring to is Thomas Dudley, who resigned, he just walked off the job, and Dudley was no lightweight in Massachusetts politics. He would eventually become a rival uh, to John Winthrop, which appears to be occurring right before our eyes now, but he was a very non-confrontational man. He was not somebody that you could go face to face with and have an argument with. Clearly, as uh, defined by his behavior here, he just walked off the job and wrote a letter that he, he resigned. Dudley is going to have his hands in several historical events, uh, many of which we're going to be discussing in future episodes. On May 1st, Winthrop met with other members of the government in Boston to discuss Dudley's desertion. The group agreed that Dudley could not leave his post, but Dudley refused to return. The group was also concerned about Dudley's dealings, namely that he had lent out seven and a half bushels of corn in exchange for ten bushels at a later date. That's a hefty interest charge. Dudley was adamant and even angry in his defense of his actions. On May 8th, the general court met in Boston, and it was decided that going forward, this group would choose the governor and the governor's assistants. And again, this is part of a, a, a new era of how government works in the new world. And this general court basically had some power and decided that they were going to be the ones that chose the governor. John Winthrop in this meeting wins re-election. 
It was at that point that Dudley accepts the role of deputy governor and was restored to his previous post. It's also noted in the writings that he and Winthrop made up the day before, so they set everything aside. John Winthrop Jr., also referred to as John Winthrop II, was named assistant, so his own son uh, assists him in government. The general court in Boston was comprised of two men from each town. Winthrop mentions in July that disagreements continued in the Watertown congregation. We talked about that last week. And in August, the short-lived truce between Winthrop and Dudley ended when, according to Winthrop, let's have a look at the writing. The deputy, Mr. Thomas Dudley, being still discontented with the governor, partly for that the governor had removed the frame of his house, which he had set up at Newtown, and partly for that he took too much authority upon him, renewed his complaints to Mr. Wilson and Mr. Weld, who acquainted the governor therewith, a meeting was agreed upon at Charlestown. So Winthrop removes the frame of Dudley's house. Interesting, interesting, interesting. And, and Winthrop then is accused of failing on his promises to build Newton, uh, later known as Cambridge. And it's referred to, I've seen it in the writings as Newton and Newtown, so, but it, it later becomes Cambridge, Massachusetts. Winthrop, you know, tearing down Dudley's house I'm not sure where that is going to uh, bring about any sense of unity. Winthrop answers that a house had been built and that servants were working from it there in the town of Newton. Also, he alleges that Dudley's home was housing unproductive servants, and that was why it was demolished. I, I would love to know what an unproductive servant was in the 1630s. The independent body ruled that Winthrop was at fault for removing Dudley's house, specifically doing so without consulting with his assistants. Winthrop admitted his fault, but Dudley uh, was not done there. He wanted Winthrop's power to be limited. An argument ensued in which both Dudley and Winthrop became angry before others in the group had to calm them down. So, you know, this whole, well, I mean, if somebody tore my house down, it probably wouldn't be a very civil conversation. Dudley uh, goes on to question Winthrop's authority to remove uh, cannon and take it to a new fort in Boston to lend gunpowder to the Plymouth colonies, to set up trading posts in Maine, and then he goes on to add uh, four other minor charges. Winthrop responds that uh, the cannon being moved from Cambridge to Boston was because it wasn't being used and it was spoiling, so basically the cannon was just sitting there rotting. The gunpowder lent to Plymouth was his personal property and that he had a license to trade. Winthrop turned to the mediators and asked them to consider whether or not he had abused his authority. No punishment was levied on Winthrop, and uh, Winthrop himself drew up articles for limiting the power of the governor, and they were approved by the general court. I find it fascinating that 140 years before the American Revolution, the limits of authority and power in government were already being discussed in Massachusetts. In mid-August, Winthrop noted that it had been a wet summer, leading to a good corn crop, but an excessive amount of mosquitoes and rattlesnakes. A windmill was moved from Newton to Boston because it was not functioning in its capacity there. You know, this Newton-Boston rivalry is heating up, and you know now they're moving windmills. It probably worsened that rivalry. Winthrop also noted a surplus of eels and lobsters in the bay. After a resident was killed 
and robbed by a native, Winthrop increased the defense around Boston in September 1632. In October, Winthrop traveled to Plymouth and met William Bradford in person. Roger Williams, former Massachusetts Bay resident, was also present at that meeting. Not much of uh, relevance was in Winthrop's writings in 1633, other than a visit to Boston from Edward Winslow and William Bradford, Winslow now serving as the governor of Plymouth. So that relationship, as we talked about before, was off to a rough start. According to Winthrop, Bradford never wrote about it. And so now it seems that the two are regularly visiting each other. At this visit uh, in Boston from Winslow and Bradford, the two colonies discussed setting up a trading post in Connecticut to halt the aggression of the Dutch. The fall of 1633 provided a shortage of corn, unlike the prior year, but the shortage was buffered by fish and other crops planted in the colonists' gardens. So it seems like, unlike Jamestown, Massachusetts Bay was able to better manage its food supply, even with that influx of people. John Oldham also went to Connecticut to trade in the fall of 1633. Captain John Stone was banished from the colony that fall after being found in bed with another man's wife. He was to be put to death if he returned. Winthrop also received correspondence from New Netherlands requesting that he avoid the Connecticut area. So just like Bradford Winthrop getting, uh, I wouldn't say threatened, but uh, discouraged from, from being in the area as well. Winthrop also wrote about the smallpox outbreak in the winter of 1632 that killed colonists and many natives. Bradford also talked about that in Plymouth Plantation. Captain Stone would end up being killed by natives with seven other crewmen in Connecticut in January of 1634. Connecticut is starting to become this three-way hotbed of tension with the English, the Dutch, and the natives. In the spring of 1634, the annual general court was held in Boston, but the results this time were different. It wasn't John Winthrop that was chosen as governor. It was Thomas Dudley. So Winthrop uh, does not survive this political pressure, if you will, although I will say this, he was very gracious and had dinner with everybody even after losing his job. So it may have been one of those things that Winthrop actually secretly welcomed. But he is out as governor. Dudley is in. Will this change the Boston Newtown rivalry? What happens to the Massachusetts Bay next? How is Dudley's governorship? We'll find out next time on Historical Context.